Hello, I'm Arotus, and today I'm going to be talking a bit about politics, but I decided that uh, since um, this is going to be relatively dry, I might as well have something on the screen to uh, keep people entertained. So that's what uh, I'm going to do today. Uh, let me just uh, hide this here so that people don't see what I'm doing there. Uh, there we go. But anyway, what I'm going to be talking about is um, the idea of, how should I say it? Uh, well, I guess a good way to explain it is a, a political philosophy, to, to actually explain uh, which type of political philosophy is my actual political philosophy. Um, it, in the sense that uh, if someone were to ask the question, which type of government uh, would you want to have or, or establish or live under, uh, or which type of government do you think would be better? Uh, I think that uh, I would um, like to talk a little bit about what my answer to that might be. So, I believe that a good place to start is the question of should we have a government at all and and uh i in my opinion it, it is a good thing to have a government and you may ask why well th there are certain things that you can do uh, in a government that uh, may be very important that you wouldn't really be able to do very well without a government and uh, one example would probably be, if you think about it, uh, the idea of common defense. That's probably the, the biggest idea here. Because if, if you think about what if an external threat, let's say another government, because it, if you're going to be an anarchist, then and someone else who's not an anarchist tries to invade you, what are you going to do? Well, of course, you can gather up everyone together, but because you're an anarchist, it's going to be volunteers. And if, uh, let, let's say, uh, you enter into a battle, what's going to happen? You're going to need to organize into a command structure, or let's just say not having a command structure is going to be very hard in a battle, or just any crisis, really. But... So you're going to have to organize into a command structure, and if somebody doesn't like the command structure that you're trying to organize into, then you can't really do anything about it. And if someone gets scared and runs away from battle, you can't label them a, a deserter, because let's be honest, what are you going to do? You're going to say, I am going to punish you for running away uh, when you could have helped us win this battle. Uh, it's, you're an anarchist. It, it, you can't do that. So there you go. Essentially, not having any government means that you do not have the means to defend yourself well in case of a crisis. Not just, um, not not just an external threat of someone invading, but uh, just other things such as justice. Um, I think justice is important, and if someone does bad things, who's going to punish them? Uh, well, you could say that someone is, that if someone does something bad, it will be something that's obviously bad, and someone will punish them. But then you may ask, well, who is it going to be? Because even in an area where you do have laws, you have a situation where someone can get attacked on the street, and a dozen people will hear it and they'll walk by and they won't do anything. So I think it's important to at least at least have someone that can be held responsible to do something when something bad happens. And I think that that's a, a generally good thing. And the only way you can really have that is, well, the only way you can consistently have that, let, let me be fair to the anarchists here, because I know that these things are possible without a government, but they're just less likely and a lot harder. So the only way to consistently have that is to have a government. So that, that's generally why I'm not an anarchist. Um, there you go. But uh, then the question concerns leadership. 
if you're going to have a government, you could try to have a, a sort of a, a common system, um, a, a common government where everybody has equal authority uh, as um, uh, but of course, and then the majority rules. But of course, you I don't think that that's very good because again, if you end up going into a battle, um, you're gonna want a leader or and you're going to want to have leaders to deal with crises. And having everyone have equal authority uh, means that you don't really end up having, that much of a quality uh, when not, not equality quality and that actually gets me to my next point quality of leadership because of course we I, I think we've pretty well established at this point or at least I have to myself and I know people will dispute what I'm saying but that's fine okay we can we can be respectful but I think one thing that's important is not only having leadership uh, in a government, because I, I, I go to the idea of government, then leadership, then what what's next? We need quality of leadership because you don't necessarily want just anybody to be a leader. Uh, you could choose your leaders randomly, and that's what some people suggest, but I think it's better to have consistently good leadership than to have random leadership where it might be good and it might be bad, but I'm thinking, uh, but the the idea of randomized leadership, um, if it's fully randomized, is that on average people are going to be relatively good, and I don't see that as being true. I think that just like with any other field of experience, um, on average people are going to be bad at it. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, you, you talk to the average person, they're not going to be good at neurosurgery. The average person isn't trained in that. And e even if you are trained in that, there, there's still levels of quality when it concerns neurosurgery. Um, and then if you think about, and, and I think the same is true in politics. And you may think that this is uh, an argument for having career politicians and i'm going to be honest it is an argument for having career politicians i think it's better to have someone that is trained and that uh has experience than to have someone that isn't trained and doesn't have experience but uh so ultimately what i'm saying is that we need to have a system of government that selects for people that are actually good at governing. And I don't think that randomly picking people is the solution to that. So then comes the next point. If we want to select someone who is good at leading, then the question becomes, how do we select that person? What, what method are we going to use to select? And some might say, well, it's education, obviously. We're going to have a political science degree and we're going to have a, or a diplomacy degree or whichever part of government you're going into. And we're going to have people who are trained in that degree. And then we're going to pick as to whoever is the most uh, accomplished among the individuals who are trained in that uh, political science. And I think the problem that arises here is that I fully acknowledge that there are many people that are good at things that don't necessarily have a degree in what they're good at. So, uh, and, and also you also end up entering the question who defines what uh, the standards of study are and then you're back at square one uh, with uh, trying to build a level of quality and you end up having an endless uh, regress of quality there. So I don't think that that's necessarily how you build quality. Uh, another one is uh, the idea of machines, but 
I building a, a computer that's just going to be really great at doing these things. But I, I think the problem with it is that it's not very applicable universally. And that's a, another qualification I think is important. That if you're going to say that a system of government is good, it should be good in more than one situation. In, in other words, I think that uh, if a government is going to be good, it should be good not only in the information age, but also go back to the Neolithic, okay? It should still be useful back then. And if it's not useful in one of the two, then I don't think it's adequate in uh, covering the situations that it should be useful. What I'm saying is government should be seen in, in a more holistic manner, not in an ad hoc, what is the situation we are in and what do we need right now, but more in a sense of how do we uh, uh, accommodate for all these various situations that we could be in. So I think that the prerequisite technology that we should have for government is the idea of civilization and, uh, and communication. In, in other words, people settling together in groups and people being able to have a tradition of communication in a sense of being able to establish laws. The, those two things are, in my opinion, the, the fundamentals and really the only things that you should need for a government to be workable. So... I, for, for this reason, I reject uh, technologically advanced systems of government because what if we lose the technology? P people are talking about, what if we use social media? Well, what if somebody blows up an EMP? Now your government's useless. Good luck fixing that. It's not going to happen. So in, in other words, that's a fatal flaw in some governments that it, it could simply fall apart just like that. Um and that's something that sh government shouldn't have. A government shouldn't be rendered ineffectual by one single component breaking at some point. Uh, in, in other words, that that's why um, that's why I think that uh, despotism and dictatorship and uh, most monarchies, are flawed and that's because what if something happens to the person in charge or or again we need quality of leadership i mean if if someone were the absolute perfect person who knows everything uh i would think that we would be fine having a monarchy i think that would be great it would be great if we had the perfect leader to to make all the decisions, who's go always going to make the perfect choice and who knows everything of what's going on and is it capable of making the most informed choices. And uh, I just need to get a sandwich on RuneScape right now. But anyway, that would be great. And But unfortunately, I don't think that that uh, is what we're going to have. So... So anyway, it's, uh, I wonder if anybody noticed I got the random event wrong. But anyway, I'm thinking that, so I've already ruled out the idea of monarchy and, and lotocracy, which is uh, government at random. And you may ask, if we do not have a particular method of determining who is qualified, what do we do? And the solution that people, and especially uh, in, in the, the wickish era that we are in today, the solution people have suggested is, what if we just let the people choose? What if we just get the courts of public opinion and everybody gets a say, and then maybe we can pick someone. And I think 
that might work. But the problem I see with democracy, especially uh, if if it's direct democracy, there there is actually a problem. Uh, I mean, it, it can be pretty useful, but there is a problem. The problem is that the larger it becomes, the less consistently you're going to get quality. And, and the easier it is ma to manipulate, the larger it becomes. That's why uh, ideas of direct, direct democracy may work in parts of Switzerland, but would probably lead to complete chaos in a country as large as, let's say, the United States of America. So what do you do then? Well, the I, I think, and this is the government system that I came up with. What if we took the all the economic and and actually let's let's not talk about that. What if we took government and we put it in layers? Okay, because uh, so by by layers, what I mean is you vote for your municipal leadership. And why would you vote for your municipal leadership? Well, because they are the ones that are closest to you and are accessible to you. So my idea here is that accountability of leadership is related to accessibility to the leadership. So what I mean is, let's say I wanted to meet Donald Trump. Now, I might be able to arrange that, but let's see a million people wanted to meet Donald Trump. That wouldn't work, uh, at least not meeting one on one with Donald Trump. So. So it's not really possible to fully get to know your leaders if your leaders are that distant from you in the sense that they're, they're not very accessible. What you want is, is more a system where, let's say you're in a small town and you've got a mayor. And if you want to meet the mayor, you can go in and meet the mayor. And it's not hard. And anyone in the town could go meet the mayor. But and the mayor is in the town. So it's not hard to go meet the mayor. But uh, the, the problem with it on a higher level is that that's not easy and it's not as possible as it is on a lower level. So it makes sense that one should know the local leadership because those are members of the actual community that you're in. So then above that, you, you make another level. You get several communities and they all send a, a delegation or a, a delegate to a higher level and then the the person on a higher level sends uh, uh they, they all make their own leadership and they go to an, another higher level above that and, and you keep going and you keep going uh and of course you need to make sure that it's all divided so that it's manageable so if any particular level becomes too wide, it needs to be split and then it becomes manageable again. But you, you keep going to a higher level until you be actually reach the, st the state, the government, the central government that uh, has authority in uh, international disputes uh, or I, I wouldn't say national because um, I'm, I'm not really a nationalist, um, but I, I think a, a better way to say is interstate disputes. So disputes between uh, multiple sovereign states. Um, so let's, uh, let's get a bit deeper into that. So if you go into the lower levels, the lower levels of government, uh, e each level is going to offer arbitration in disputes between its lower members. And also, what the, another thing that this would do is this would significantly reduce... Uh, well, actually, let, let, let me get to my next point. 
uh, b before I get to that, because if I go into things too out of order, it, it won't make sense. So my next point is, why choose one economic system, one social system? Because that, that's what's, what happens in, in a centralized government. What happens is that you choose one economic system. You can't satisfy both the free market capitalists and the socialists. You can't. They... It has to be one or the other. You have to it, go one way or the other. And, and there's other choices too, but this is, these are the, just the two that I'm picking right now. And out of all these different choices, you have to pick one system that you're going to operate under. And of course, that upsets a lot of people. And that's not really necessarily a good thing to have. So I'm thinking, what if instead, instead of doing this really divisive thing of having a, uh, a a really divisive thing of having this one system that everyone has to operate under. How about instead you decentralize the economic and the social system? So, uh, and, and I mean, on a, on a very very large level decentralized. So, and and to which level decentralized? To the municipal level. So each community gets to decide its own laws as to which economic and, uh, and social system they're going to operate under. Uh, and, and when I say social system, I refer to um, other matters of law, such as public morality, things like that. Uh, because I... I think that uh, there are people that don't like hate speech and, and that they don't want to live in a government that allows hate speech. And you know what? To, to some extent, we can allow them to regulate that themselves in their own towns. And they can live in their own towns where they do this, that, and the other thing. The SJWs, they can live in their own little towns where they do these things and... And then the, the anti-SJWs can live in their little towns where they, where they do their anti-SJW things. And the, the people that believe in uh, that, that uh, all races are equal can live in their towns. And the racists can live in their towns. And therefore, everyone is allowed to have some degree of honesty in, in how they live. And, and so uh, then... Your citizenship is not only extending to the, the overall state that is above everything, but is also, it, it, uh, it also extends to your community that you live in. And then you would have it so that in order to enter a community, you need the permission of that community to become a member of that community. Um, and I, I think that would work. Uh, because it means that if you don't like your specific system that you live in, you can move somewhere else. You can ask if, uh, another community to take you in and they can take you in. Now, there's a lot of minutia that I've elaborated, uh, uh, not outwardly, but I've elaborated in my head a lot of minutia relating to this, but I'm not going to get into that too much right now. So this would mean that you could have in individuals who want their system of common ownership and they can live in their towns that do that and you can also have people that are uh that are libertarians living in their towns and they can do that and i think that would be great because it means that i that people wouldn't have to worry about fighting in order to get their systems. Now, of course, there would have to be some common rules, such as that there would be certain crimes that are illegal in the entire state, such as, let, let's say, murder, assault, um, rape, theft, vandalism. Those things should be illegal anywhere. Um, and, of course... The each uh, municipality would have its own authority in uh, enforcing those laws and 
could get censored or or punished by by its supervising body by unanimous vote if there is a, a gross uh, breach in uh, morality or by majority vote uh, if there is a uh, an unconstitutional situation that is happening uh, because those things do need to be dealt with. And, of course, there would also be higher uh, laws uh, relating to currency. And the way I would do the currency is, is like this. There would be a currency that would be uh, primarily used by the government. And in the sense that if you want to have a local system, a free exchange in your community, that's fine. If you want to barter, that's also fine. If you want to use a different form of credit, that's fine. But the government, the central government, for its, uh, for its debts would use a currency. Okay, well, I, I, I should say a form of credit. And I, I have come to the realization that basing currency on on materials is probably not the best idea. So instead, I decided to base the currency on a simple proportion of the population uh, inside of the state. In other words, the government would ensure that the currency is controlled by its own scarcity, therefore making the, the credit its own commodity. And that would be ensured by uh, expanding the currency to fit the size of the population. Uh, so let's say it's a million units of currency per person, which may sound a lot, like, like a lot, but uh, if you think about the idea of income inequality and the fact that this is primarily used by the government uh, for its own purposes, then it's not a lot if you think about it that way. So a million per person and a new person becomes a citizen, then you, you add a million more credit in circulation if people die uh, or the population reduces, you need to re you need to slowly reduce the amount of credit in circulation. If uh, if uh, if a physical form of the currency gets old, of course you replace it. So therefore, there would be a balance where the currency would be based on let me just see this for me okay the currency would be based on the overall population and that way it, and it would have to be done constitutionally and that way you would not have to worry about runaway inflation because the government wouldn't be allowed to print more than they're allowed to have uh, in in the state. Not that the government would be allowed to print more money for themselves, but that the overall amount of money that exists in the country is therefore regulated. And I, I think that would be very good as opposed to other systems. Because uh, let's say your money is based on gold. If someone suddenly finds a gold mine, your currency crashes. There you go. Or if someone gets really stingy with the gold and, uh, and, and buries a lot of it, then uh, there's suddenly a, a huge amount of deflation. So, and... and you don't really want that form of instability in a form of credit. You want it to have an amount of consistency in its value. So the way that taxation would work is that taxation is divided 
to the municipalities based on their populations. In other words, what, what happens is the central government makes its budget and then it, the, the, the budget is divided to each municipality based on the number of people in it. Or to be more accurate, a way would be to uh, divide the budget by the total population and then multiply by the size of each municipality. So what would happen then is that, th by the way, I this is not taxed on every individual and the my earlier thing about the currency was not talking about universal basic income either. So this is not on an individual basis is what I'm saying. Uh, it, it's just that the taxation is divided equally based on, on the population. So then each municipality is responsible for accruing that specific amount of credit and then putting that credit up uh, to the government. Now, of course, each level of government will also do the same and also divide its uh, budget and send it down to the inferiors so that the municipality then has all these different taxes that they, they have to account for and then they can choose whichever way they want to tax. They can choose to collectively, as a municipality, interact and, and collectively uh, gain the credit by collectively acting economically uh, as, a, as a single unit. They could decide to instead um, do an, an income taxation or an estate taxation if the credit is used by the population of course because otherwise it wouldn't make sense and and what this does is it makes the taxation fair in the sense that each municipality is taxed based on the amount of population in that municipality and it encourages the municipalities to establish laws that allow for the municipalities to be prosperous because if they're not prosperous then they're going to do very poorly based on on the taxation in the sense that they're not going to be able to pay their taxes and if a municipality doesn't pay its taxes then its government gets replaced uh, by by the higher level it's a uh, it um, essentially gets put in a, in a bad place. So essentially what this government does is it holds the municipalities accountable for the systems. Now, let me go back to the democracy on how this works. So every person who is a citizen, a free citizen, let, let me emphasize this, every person who is a free citizen is allowed to vote on their municipal elections and these elections have to be done in a way that it is possible to initiate the election by a vote of no confidence that everyone is allowed to have free speech in relation to whatever is going on in any issue that is even tangential to the election because obviously making threats isn't necessarily considered free speech in many areas or, or is, is not considered valid free speech or yelling fire in a crowded location in, in many places is a crime and uh, I, I wouldn't say that I would disallow them to declare such things to be crimes but anything that is tangentially relevant to an election is free game. So you, you can fully criticize politically, uh, economically, and socially because those are the, the aspects that are determined. 
and and of course as i said earlier since the social and economic laws are fully put into the authority of a local government it makes sense that people would be involved in their local governments and it's easy to get involved because the leadership doesn't have to divide their attention between millions of people in in other words if if there's a large city it would have to be divided into subunits is what i'm saying uh as well but anyway the elections should be it, it should be possible to initiate the voting at any time in a sense uh, of, of course within reason there, there should be of course maybe you, you could say that there we could determine a specific amount of time to limit uh how much uh people are allowed to uh how, how frequently people are allowed to hold elections because otherwise it would become a total mess additionally whichever positions are elected should also be capable of fully replacing whichever positions are not elected. In other words, if there's an appointed position in the government, the elected positions of the government should be able to replace them because otherwise it puts it, it reduces the power. And then this also filters up to the higher levels. There should be a, a capability of making votes of no confidence to the higher levels of government from the lower levels of government, which means that in short order you should theoretically be able to replace the entirety of the government uh, sim simply by the votes of the people uh, and uh, by by then the people putting their wills in their superiors who put their wills in their superiors and i think the system of having tiered layers of government ensures good leadership because if you have the local leaders that you know and you trust and how do you know you can trust them? It's because you know them, because they're in your community. Uh, at, at, because that's really, in my opinion, the best way that you can ensure that quality is created on a democratic level. And they then have people that they trust that they send to the higher levels. And those people then being politically of expertise have people that they trust that they can send to higher levels uh, and what this creates is a filter that ensures that the highest levels of government are the most trusted individuals not trusted by the population at large but trusted by the people that are trusted by the people that are trusted by the people that are trusted it creates a filter which actually means that the government becomes less corrupt the larger it becomes in scope which is i think a big problem of some types of government that they they end up becoming more corrupt the larger they get uh, not not larger in the size of the power of the government in in society but larger in the sense of more territory and and more people that are controlled and and therefore i believe that a, a sign of a good system of government is the potential for infinite expansion that by that i mean it should be possible on on a local level let's say you've got a, one single valley somewhere with a few towns in it and i think this government could work and it should also be possible on let's say a hypothetical intergalactic level there you go and and that's what i think marks a, a government that it's not just useful from a, uh, a, a, a small valley or uh, on an intergalactic level, or it's not just useful in the Neolithic or in the information age, but it's useful everywhere in between. And therefore, you don't need to change the constitution. So ultimately, what, I, what I'm saying is there should be a, a constitution that you don't need to change it, that, that it's designed in a particular way that there shouldn't really be any reason that any situation should arise that would need you to change the constitution. And again, this argument go, goes back to a highly decentralized decentralized state, but also on um, a, a different level. But anyway, this also helps reduce election meddling. Why? 
and by meddling, what am I referring to? I'm not talking about uh, fraud in, in elections. I'm not talking about people uh, high up in the government messing things up. What I'm saying is the media and uh, propaganda and things like that, that's a lot less effective if the people that are making the decisions, uh, especially in relation to voting, know the people that are voting for. In other words, it's it's hard to lie about someone that everybody knows personally. It, it's hard to get away with it. Well, it's harder. Let, let me be fair here. It is still possible, but it's harder to get away with such a lie. And that's means that lobbying uh, it becomes less powerful. It means that the media ultimately has very little manipulation because this is a problem with large scale democracy. It's that large medias have a large amount of influence, which means that if the, the people collectively have a decision to make on a very large scale, let's say, for example, the president of the United States of America, it's very easy for them to be manipulated and it's very easy for them to have misinformation given to them. And therefore, it's possible to game the system by using a system of information, which is a lot more difficult to do when you actually know the people you're talking about. And of course, the, the mass media has a lot smaller effect if the people who are in the higher levels of government are not actually directly influenced by the masses. In other words, if there's public outrage over something, I don't want the government to get on the outrage train because that's not productive. That's not good. What I want the government to do is to remain calm and to look through things in an intelligent manner and to see what's actually going on and and to maybe if there isn't actually a problem if it's something someone's overreacting to not do anything that would actually be a good thing but uh unfortunately that's not always what happens so there you go so i i would be happy for people to tell me what they think about what I'm saying. Uh, maybe I should start making some charts uh, showing you exactly what I mean. So, because when it concerns this type of government, has it ever existed, this specific type? And what, what I'm talking about when I say specific type is I'm actually getting really deep into this in the sense that not just, oh, decentralized democracy, everybody knows what that is well not everybody let's be fair here but it's something that is a relatively common concept but what i'm talking about is more on on the idea of the municipalities have the the social and the um economic authority there's there is a central government that does have military authority um and of course i would also say that each level of government would theoretically be allowed to have military authority as well. So you could have a, a local military for what whichever reason. And there are situations where that is indeed useful uh, to have a local military that is not necessarily uh, reliant upon the central military. And of course, I would also separate the, the military from the civil power um, in the sense that the let's say we would have a president of a council uh, at the very top of uh, uh, the the senior um you could say it's a parliament uh, a senior council at the very top that has uh, delegates from the first level divisions of the government and you've got the leader of that who's not an authoritative or authoritarian leader but more uh, presides over the legislation, that leader would not have military authority under the system. What would happen is the, th that t senior council, the, the superior council, would elect the 
the um, the military leader of the int of the central government, and that military leader would not have civil authority. But what would then happen is, in cases of emergency, the military leader would be allowed to take over for a limited amount of time after which that the the govern the central government needs to regularly have to either vote to extend that power or it automatically is discontinued and if and whenever this state of emergency ends the the military leader is to be on full account and any attempt at a military coup or at uh, the military leader escaping the responsibility would have to be, in my opinion, be followed by a general warrant of arrest or capital punishment in the sense that if this person refuses arrest by anyone and, and i literally mean anyone i would say that the government should give authority constitutionally that if someone's doing a military to coup anyone is allowed to arrest whoever is involved and anyone is allowed to execute that person if that person refuses the arrest and of course if you do indeed do this you also have to go to court afterwards to uh, clear your name and to justify your actions because we don't want people randomly killing military leaders. That's not what we want. But I think giving people the authority to at any time kill someone involved in a coup is actually a good thing. Uh, and it's not just people in the military, literally anyone. That person becomes essentially an outlaw and it has no protection under the law if they don't submit to arrest but that that's just my opinion there uh, as and there are three categories of crimes that i would talk about in this form of government there's of course the 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 local law the municipal law that is established by the local governments and is enforceable locally, um, of course, uh, with maybe exceptions on highways and, and things like that. And of course, having good faith and credit uh, to other uh, local governments so that uh, nothing bad happens. Then there would be the state law, the, the law of the state, um, which would have to be all, all really big things. Uh, and then there's uh, the, the common uh, moral law, which would be the no murder, no rape, things like that. So in regards to the state law, I would say that that needs to be enforced most vigorously out of the three. It, not in the sense that the, they, the others shouldn't be enforced as much, not in a, in a sense of amount, but in a sense of uh, the government or the, the people in general should take the greatest offense towards someone breaking the overall law of the state. Why? Because it is something that undermines the state and therefore the security of every single citizen. Therefore, I think that people found to be involved in, in forgery should be extended capital punishment. And on, on the issue of capital punishment, I would say that for every other crime, the, the local crimes, and even the the, the crimes that uh, are the general crimes, such as murder, rape, and things like that, those, those the, the general crimes have to be, those laws have to be enforced and, and the people have to, who are found guilty of doing such things have to be punished in some way, but it's up to the local government to decide how that's done. But 
and the local law, of course, also up to the local government. But the laws of the state have should have very specific prescribed punishments because they are so important to the integrity of the state. So forgery, I think, should be capital punishment. And you may say that's pretty extreme, but I think it's fair enough. If you're going to undermine the state, then the state undermines you. Insurrection, capital punishment, period. There you go. If you're going to be a rebel, if you're going to be a revolutionary, you're not willing to go through your your systems of local government to get the system you want, or you're not willing to move somewhere else where there's a system you want, or maybe you're just generally hostile to whichever system of government there is, uh, and, and you actually want something that's relatively hostile, then... Uh, and you actually go into a revolution because of this, then, you know, if you're hostile to the government, the government is going to be hostile to you. There you go. And I think that this should be extended to anyone who knowingly and willfully uh, engages in insurrection. That means that it's not just the leaders, okay? If there's... 10,000 people who are not military who join a rebellion, all 10,000 can fall under that potential punishment. You could theoretically have to kill all 10,000. And I would say that that is a good thing. Why? Because it discourages insurrection. Because people should be encouraged to use other means, civil means, legal means to go through with this. But of course, I, I would say that to, in, in the interest of fairness, you could give clemency to people who maybe uh, for, for particular reasons, if there is a unanimous vote by whichever council becomes responsible to, to uh, determine these things. In other words, if 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 you have a rebellion, everybody automatically gets the capital punishment unless the entirety of the government says, no, we're not going to kill these people. And if you trust that the the high levels of government are trustworthy, then you shouldn't have a problem there. But anyway... I think that this government has a good potential for success. And why does it? Because on the local level, people are actually encouraged to be engaged in their government because they can actually decide quite a lot on the local level. The vast majority of this government is involved on a local level, or maybe even the absence of government involved on a local level, if you want to be maybe a less hard government person. So the vast majority of what happens government-wise happens on the local level. So when I'm talking about capital punishment and uh, the taxation system and, and all that, that's just a small part. The vast majority, pretty much everything else, education, um, if you want health care, maybe you, you can decide whether or not you want to have public health care on the local level. It's not going to be on the state level just saying that the state won't be doing that. But if you actually want it, then uh, you can have it on a local level. It's just uh, your taxes, man. It's your taxes. Or or if you live in a more commune idea, then it's maybe not your taxes, but uh, there you go. So it's it's on the local level, there's a lot of authority and, and a lot of accountability. And because the power is concentrated on the local level, the power holders will not be will willing to easily give that up. Because uh, if, if you think about it uh, in a different way, the, what happens in the US is that theoretically, 
the um the people can make uh can get around issues with your local government by going to a higher level of government and appealing to a higher level of authority to do something on the lower level uh, because the higher levels have more authority than the lower levels and therefore they can do more things which means that you end up undermining your lower levels of government as time goes by especially whenever anyone says the president should do this the president should do that whenever you're saying that you're undermining your state governments just so you know uh, unless it's something specifically that the president is supposed to do but anyway getting back on track this would be less of a problem because the only people that the locals could specifically uh, appeal to directly is the local government and unless there's a constitutional problem in which case they should be allowed to appeal to a higher level to get that resolved but then those groups can send delegations to the higher levels and if they don't like what their delegations are doing on the higher levels, they can take it back. And they're not going to be willing to send people that promise to give away their powers to the higher levels. Now, let me just be very clear. I'm not saying that the local governments would be disallowed from associating for common commerce laws and common laws re relating to this, that, or the other thing. I think that they should be allowed and perhaps even encouraged to do such things just because it's convenient and easy to have these associations, but they should also not be bound by them. In, in other words, if there is a law that you want changed in your local government, the government should have the full power to change it at any time. Un unless, uh, well, maybe, maybe you can put a statute in there that it might be three months at, at least, uh, just so that you don't get too crazy with uh, power shifts. But anyway, so if we assume that people want power, it's going to be hard for them to want to give it to the higher levels. And et cetera. And it, and it goes all the way up. And at the same time, as I said, the mass media manipulation would not be as easy on the higher levels of government as it is on, let's say, the, the common people. So that lends itself to another form of stability that I think that direct democracy does not have, or even the, the type of direct uh, representative, sorry, democracy that the United States has when it goes to elect a president, that doesn't have that type of stability. It's still pretty easy to manipulate a lot of people through mass media. So, and, and this is a problem, but uh, then of course you've got all these different systems and what it means that if every individual is taxed the same way uh, on the municipal level, um, not, not that every person is taxed individually, but if every municipality is taxed based on the proportion of our population. It means that they are in competition with one another, which means you've got different social and economic systems in competition with each other, which means that if you believe that uh, being against racism is a good thing, you're probably going to do better business with people that believe the same way and, and people that are more diverse than people that are racist, which means you're probably going to be more successful and more prosperous. And then they'll see that and then they will question their choices of ideology and there you go uh, same thing with socialism and free market capitalism you actually get a situation where you can actually work these things out to some extent of course there's there are limits to how far you can work these things out because you still need to be one country and the the central government still needs to have authority to enforce the the basic crimes which uh are enforced on the local level, but if the local level doesn't enforce it, they can get punished by the higher levels. Um, so there you go on that note. So I, I think that this form of government would, in general, 
provide for better leadership than representative democracy, than direct democracy, than hereditary monarchy, and than uh, uh, lotocracy, than a lot of systems of government. And uh, and I, I was going to talk about historical examples. And again, I can't really find any particular historical example of how this has happened in any way. I mean, there, there's some parts where in India, there's some decentralization when it concerns elections uh, and uh, decision making. And I think that I think most of the stuff I've read about decentralized democracy is coming from India. And by the way, I, I didn't come to this particular system by reading about it. I came to it by just thinking about all these different things. I, I tried to think about every single system, and this is what I decided. And also, I, I'm thinking the only thing that I think is remotely similar is the Soviet system. Uh, which sounds kind of weird because in practice it's not similar at all, but in, in the sense that what the Soviets and where the, the word Soviet comes from is that they had a, groups of people in local areas uh, that would elect leaders and then they had infra orders among that where they would then go to a, a, a larger more regional soviet etc and i think that was a, a maybe an interesting system it would have been nice to see how, how it worked out but unfortunately it it was taken over by the communists uh, uh by by the bolsheviks and uh, various socialist groups who enforced a, a sort of a ideological system rather than uh what I would have preferred. Um, and that's not how it turned out. And and it was sort of, the proof is in the pudding in, in some essence, it, in the sense that, of course, a lot of these councils were workers' councils. Hmm, very interesting. Sounds very Marxist to me. And, and councils of people who worked in a particular factory and, and things like that. So it, it certainly wasn't inclusive in the way that I would have wanted my system to be. Nice armor, by the way. So there you go. Uh, but I, I still think that in in the end, the, the Soviet system ends up being very different from what I envisioned anyway. But uh, looking at it, th there's another system that... Uh, there's some guy in, I think it was Kurdistan, who was talking about uh, a form of confederalism, but, uh, and I couldn't really find out much about it, but from my re what I read, it's actually very different for, from what I'm interested in. What I'm essentially trying to say here is that I can't really find anybody else who has the exact same system that I have. So this is, I would say, Although component-wise, none of these ideas are original, I think this idea is actually an original idea in the putting together of it anyway. So tell me what you think. Do you think that it's maybe interesting or maybe not so interesting? Um, of course, actually implementing the system from uh, any existing system would be very difficult because you'd have to change so many different things. And although I think that it would work, I don't think it would be the most effective. Uh, well, no, it, it would be effective, but I don't think that a transition would be easy, in, in essence, because you'd have to write the whole constitution. And the constitution of any state that follows this particular system would essentially be the same. Um, it, there wouldn't be any reason for any differences because okay let's let's actually go off on a tangent um maybe i should make this a separate video uh you know what i am going to make this a separate video